This is Off Planet Radio. Welcome back to another episode of Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. Pleased, proud to be back, semi-healthy. Sorry about the voice. It's still recovering from the uh, episode with bronchial pneumonia. So um, we got a great guest lined up. Emily is here with me. I will be the semi-silent one tonight, um, stepping in merely to provide background color. I'm the Howard Cosell of Talk Radio. There we go. Anyway, here we go. This is Off Planet Radio. Emily, welcome back and welcome to our guest who you are going to introduce. Absolutely. Glad, glad you're back and that you're feeling better, Randy. It's been a little bit since we did a regular show together, so yeah, I'm able to do this tonight. And It'll I be fun. This, this, I was originally going to do this show on my own, but after having a pre-show with our guest last week, I decided and asked you if you wanted to be part because I thought yeah, there could be some really interesting conversation. So you put whatever you need to in that tea so that you'll have something to say. But <laughs> All right, guys. So um, our guest tonight is Michael Joseph. And um, it's been about two years since Michael was on the show with us and about a year and a half since I was last on his podcast. And um, it's kind of interesting because from the outset, there doesn't seem to be a lot of crossover between things I've done and things he's kind of into. He's most well known for his occult science series, his work on the, on the JFK. You know, he makes everything into a long series of many episodes. You know, uh, he's done stuff on astrology, cryptocurrency, all sorts of stuff. And he kind of left off before he took a bow out from the alternative media with a series that kind of stumped me at first, which was the Occult Catholic series. And I was actually, when I looked a little bit into it, surprised to find that in the, over the course of the series, he referred to work that, that, that I had done. And so I was like, I'm going to take a little look into this when I have some time. At the time he put it out, I was really busy. And then he kind of disappeared from the alternative media for a bit. And we chat a little in the background. Michael and I have a little bit of a friendship. And I knew he was going through some transition and whatnot. But last week, we had a chance to have a conversation. And it was really interesting. And I spent a good part of this week listening to some of that series, um, the Occult Catholic series. I focused on the alchemy section at his suggestion. And so he's here tonight to tell us, uh, in the first hour, really take us deep into what his research uncovered. And then in the second hour, we're going to get into what it meant for him personally as in kind of a way that all of our all of our journeys mean something to us informationally and then something personally so i'm really looking forward to this conversation michael joseph welcome back to off planet radio great to be here it's been a while and uh i'm excited to do a few talks i got a couple other ones coming out and uh you guys are really like the first one i've done in, in quite a while that I can remember. So welcome this back. Is where I, this is where I would want to be for the, the return. <laughs> it's, it's, it's good to see you back. I, I, I saw your Twitter post a couple of weeks ago and saw what you were, were getting into. And that was right before Emily had mentioned that she was talking to you in the background. And you, know, I, you did a lot of intense material over the years, which anybody who's done like alternative media knows this isn't just about putting facts and research and information out. Talk show hosts go through a, a, really an alchemical process of all the information that we take in, process, and then filter through our own consciousness, our own structures of belief and whatever. So taking a break from uh, doing this sometimes is probably the sanest thing you can do. <laughs> yeah, and... Um you know, my break was partially continuing on and doing the new website and the member section that I just released, but then that got derailed by a lot of personal things in my life, and, you know, it wasn't anything that I necessarily had to deal with. It was other people and other external situations, kind of things melting down a little bit within my family, and then also... uh you know, some other <laughs> organizational issues. And um, so that derailed me. And then before 
I released the website. I got this crazy bout of insomnia and I wasn't like, I wouldn't say I was super nervous about it, but it was just kind of odd that I'd never really had that type of insomnia before. So I don't know, a lot was going on the last nine months and then just getting away from the YouTube world, the Twitter world and stuff like that. Um, it was really kind of nice. <laughs> the, insomnia, <laughs> totally, yeah. the, the insomnia thing is actually um, somewhat, of a, a mini epidemic. I've heard a lot of people talking about this. I went through it for periods last summer mm -hmm. where my sleep patterns were just all over the place. Either sleep too long or couldn't sleep for like, you know, weeks at a time. So, I mean, I think some of this is like shifts that are going on right now and uh, uh, kind of where we're at in the realm of humanity. Yeah, and I, I'd always struggle when I was younger with uh, really terrible sleeping habits and, you know, just a lot of things, just a certain amount of depression and stuff like that. And I, I had a lot of goofy sleeping patterns that I kind of, you know, inherited <laughs> from my family a bit. And um, so it took me a while to kind of work through that in my 20s and then, you know, getting a, a stable job. Uh, working in a kitchen for many years and then um you know that that kind of puts you in balance and then um you know being a musician you're kind of used to staying up later so i've always been a yep. night owl and i've actually recently forced myself to turn it around and, and get up much earlier and it was a big struggle but uh, a few things got me through it and so far so good i've been able to get up fairly early um and not go to bed too late you know it's one of those things where uh, you're in the zone and you just don't think about time and all of a sudden it's like four in the morning. So. There you go. Don't think about time. We're anti-time here. We're yeah, anti-linearity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No time here. No time. All right. So let's, Michael, I want, you know, people, you, you're really well known for like, especially your occult science series, um, you know, and, and then you did, you've done a lot of series on like astrology, you did a series on occult cryptocurrency. Occult, Catholic, occult, occult Catholics, uh, you know, series after those seems like a hard turn in another direction. Why? Yeah, it's funny because when I um, started looking into it, it was actually more of a unification of things. Um, I guess if I was going to try to sum it up, uh, well, I guess maybe I should just give a couple quick disclaimers. Um, my my basic position on all of this, especially once I got into it, is uh, what I just started discovering is there's a lot of dialectics that are formed around the Catholic Church and in ways that are at its, its expense and kind of creating lies about it that are pretty heinous at times. And for any things that the Catholic Church has done in reality, once you slice through those things, that is, uh, you know not the greatest thing ever. Uh, usually the groups attacking, if you look at their tradition, they've either done just as bad or far worse, but they're better at disguising it. And so after doing that, I realized that the exoteric world that we all complain about, uh, the matrix, if you will, there were a lot of things that that promotes that are also promoted in the alternative media. And to me, that's always a red flag, you know? Um, and so, can you give us an example of that? I'm interested in expanding that a little bit. Sure. Um, I, t I tend to find that a lot of people promote sort of theosophical Freemasonic views in the alternative media, but they also at the same time bash those things. So a lot of people, for example, I, I think Madame Blavatsky is a great example. If there's a lot of people who will be like, oh, she's, you know, some fraud or some New World Order figurehead or something like that right and they'll kind of bash her and then they'll promote ideas that i felt like i read in secret doctrine and isis unveiled which is confusing to me it's like well if she's this evil archon or what do you want to call her why are you promoting the same ideas she wrote about that doesn't make sense to me and it kind of in indicates that they just aren't aware of it you know and so that was a lot of the occult science going through freemasonry and theosophy 
and just showing how intrinsically connected it is to a lot of the things we promote today. And I think the best example probably is if you watch Neil deGrasse Tyson or Carl Sagan's Cosmos, you'll find that they give the Masonic history about certain figures like Hypatia of Alexandria or Giordano Bruno. And I read those same histories verbatim in the theosophical books and stuff like that. And then the other unifying factor is the United Nations is straight up following theosophy through their Lucius Trust and everything that they write about, um, you know, <laughs> you, could, you could see them all connected. And so there's also the other side of the coin where, um, you know, in the alternative media, there's a big Protestant Christian presence. And I've mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. <laughs> been quite adverse to that. There's a lot of things that I appreciate about aspects of it. And there was a time where I seriously was looking into that whole angle on it. But then I also found out that they said a lot of the same things as the Masons and the Theosophists, who they're supposed to be battling against when it comes to the Catholic Church. There's a dialectic where they say the exact same propaganda and buzz terms. And for example, you know, when you watch the media, you watch Fox News and MSNBC, and, you know, they'll have their little battle about this or that. But when they start to unify on the same things like 9-11 narratives and stuff like that, you have to wonder, well, is this a dialectic and there's, you know, two sides or two wings of one bird kind of thing. And I started noticing that about Protestantism and Freemasonry, how they say the exact same buzz terms uh, to bash the Catholic Church, like the Dark Ages and superstition and fanaticism, and especially around the Jesuits. Now, there's a lot of nuance to these things. And so once I was kind of confused as to why Madame Blavatsky kind of freaks out about the Jesuits, but uses Protestant propaganda in order to promote her theories about them. And then I hear those same things coming from the Protestants. There's something not right about that to me. And so then I started looking into the Catholic angle. I got into people like E. Michael Jones, Jay Dyer, even though he's not the biggest fan of Roman Catholicism, he's still part of that tradition, at least from the first thousand years of Christianity. And I think one of the main things that when I learned that for the first thousand years of Christianity, usury was a mortal sin, meaning no debt slavery, then things started to make sense that, wow, there's something really weird going on here. So that's kind of my, I guess, intro where I'm just trying to defend it from the accusations against it that I think are made up and false and that the things about it that it teaches that people will have problems with, people are free to accept or reject it. But I see enough things there that have brought me back to it. I also grew up Roman Catholic, but at the same time, I consider it very Protestantized, Masonicized, and Judaized, all three, mm -hmm, the enemies mm -hmm, yeah. have hit it. And that really ties into a lot of the JFK assassination stuff in retrospect. Once I started looking into that, all the JFK ritual stuff and Kabbalah surrounding it, it made sense to me. So I guess that, that's my long-winded intro. <clears throat> I guess what courses through all of this is that nothing occurs in a vacuum. And so there's, there's overlap. And I, you know, I'm hearing what you're saying because I come from the opposite spectrum. I come from the evangelical Christian side of this thing even up to about probably 10 years ago, I was doing Christian broadcasting. And I did hard turns away from that, and I drove into the Gnostic side of it, which is basically mystical Protestantism, I guess. But that overlaps as well into a lot of the things that filtered even down into theosophy and things like that. So I'm interested in. You, you sort of separate a line and you place it the first thousand years. Can you kind of maybe go into why that particular demarcation in time? Yeah, that's at least when the East and the West was more or less unified and then Byzantium. I'm still kind of studying that time period. I'm actually, I'm a bit more well-versed in like the Middle Ages Renaissance up until the Enlightenment and the 19th century. But I've been looking into that time period a bit more, trying to flesh some things out. And so that is when, you know, European pagan tribes are starting to convert to Christianity. And that is, you know, after several hundred years of all the chaos of zero to, you know, two, 300 AD. And a lot of people will debate, you know, what was really going on then. 
But I found it interesting that so many of the types of debates and the different philosophers and the different things going on then, it's like there's no new ideas. Everything I hear people promote today, you can just trace back to then. But a lot of people just don't know that. And so they, sometimes you think your own ideas are your own. And then I'm reading stuff from like, you know, even uh, just like Protestant dissenters who are rebelling against the Anglican church. I'm like, wow, that sounds like most people in the truth world today when I read what these dissenters are saying. And that's kind of, I think, the ingrained Americanism. But back to the, the thousand years, um, you know, uh, the capital for Christianity basically moved to Constantinople through Constantine. And, um, you know, there's a lot of battles going on during that time. Um, and then there's the Bishop of Rome and then Rome falls and they're kind of dealing with protection issues. The idea of the unification of the church and state, as much as that's a horrific idea to people in the West today, especially America, um, the idea is that the emperors do the state functions, but they protect the church and they, you know, they execute the state functions with the church principles driving it. So it's kind of like the state is the temporal realm, but the spiritual ideology, uh, uh, excuse me, ideologies are what are, you know, driving it, right? So the state's like the car and then the, the spiritual ideology is like the fuel, something like that. And the fuel is more important, you know, that that's, it's kind of like uh, the, the spirit in the the matter unified and working together at least that's the goal <laughs> obviously there's a lot of conflicts with that and that gets into gnosticism where that kind of divorces them and then you have like a return to the the pagan kings where you know they deem their rulers to be kind of like god incarnate kind of thing where that's not the concept in christianity but some of the pagan rulers still had that kind of ingrained in them so it's kind of a long process of purging a lot of things that were seen as bad, but it was co-opting the things in the Hellenistic culture that was good. And that is what I think is missing amongst a lot of Protestants who get angry about the Catholic church being pagan and all this kind of stuff. It's that they were able to use a lot of the pagan literature and give it a fusion with Judaism in a way that they deemed to be true. And that's the unification of the Jewish and Gentile culture at that time. And then you have an offshoot where the Pharisees and the rabbinical tradition that rejected Christ, they become modern Judaism. And after the temple is destroyed in 70 AD, it goes off into Talmudic Judaism, which is a whole other topic. And so there's kind of different avenues, but I think where Kabbalah comes in, that is a unification of the Greek and Jewish culture in a completely inverted way from Catholicism. And that's why I, in my opinion, Freemasonry and Kabbalah are kind of like the inverted unification of what the Catholic tradition is. Okay. Um, where do you, in your perspective going back, can, can you kind of spin back? I don't want to get too arcane about this, but I'm interested in your views about it. Pre-Constantine, let's say that period immediately after, we'll say 33 AD up to, you could probably run it up to probably 160 AD, They're coming into the era of the early church fathers, of that what you would call the primitive church, and how you view that relative to this, this, this first thousand years. Because I see a demarcation there in terms of the transition that occurred in Christianity as it was practiced early, which included in some form a certain amount of socialism in communities and things like that. And the way that it was done, it was not Judaized at that point. It was also basically a church under persecution. And then it kind of drifts into that period where you see the establishment. Constantine seems to be the landmark on that with, you know, the cross, with this sign you shall, you shall rule. But that early period there, how do you view that in terms of coming forward into the period where the church itself becomes what I'll call monolithic? Yeah. Um, again, I am not super well read on this time, so I'm going to kind of give some intuition with what I know as well. But it seems yeah, to no, me that's that fair. if that's you, fair. Um, you know, you take the idea of the, the mustard seed parable, mm -hmm. that's 
in the Catholic teaching, this is the parable for European Christendom. And so it starts out small, then you have the you know apostles bringing that out, and then there's a lot of persecution. And the idea in Catholicism is that revelation mostly happened during this time period, whereas Protestantism generally thinks that there's a millennium to come and you know Jesus is going to come back as like a physical ruler for a thousand mm-hmm. years and it gets right. it gets into some kind of interesting does, territory yeah. right yeah. um but that millennialism as far as i understand has kind of a distinctive jewish element that if they don't accept christ then they're still waiting for a millennium too so this is a weird relationship with protestantism and judaism on yeah. one side and then there's the other side of the coin where you were talking about a lot of more like gnostic stuff that kind of gets into it so the way i guess i would describe it is they're formulating the church during this time. And that's kind of the idea is that the, the, the Catholic church is a new Israel. It's the continuation of the old Israel, but it's the right tradition. There's a lot of corruption, a lot of bad things that go on. And so the idea is that they're bringing this about through the blood of the saints. So there's like, you know, the, the Jews wanted a, a military king to destroy the Roman empire and basically reign supreme. And then they, they get their Messiah that is, you know, sacrificing and dying. And like, you know, what is that? That's not conquering the Romans. But what's interesting about it, and this gets into the idea of like alchemy, is that this is fusing the Greek and Jewish culture. So this is a time of turmoil where things are being kind of weeded out. And I think that that has to do with like the wheat and the tares growing together. And at some point, it's sorted out. And I think that once Christianity takes root and is allowed to be an official religion with the, uh, the Constantine's, uh, what's it? The edict of, I can't remember. 313 is when it happens. And that's an interesting number related to JFK assassination, right? Frame 313. And that's why I think there's a reference back to this, this weird thousand year period that's from then until the Templars in 1313 roughly. Um, I'm not saying that there's a literal thousand years in the Catholic viewpoint. That's not the teaching, but there kind of still is in a way, it just depends on where you mark it. And so I think that things get formulated. That was the edict of Milan, by the way. Okay. Yeah. There you yeah, go. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and also there's the, the prediction that this kingdom, there'll be kings and priests. And so that evolves into mm-hmm. Christendom where there are kings and priests. And in traditional Judaism, there are kings and stuff like that. So the idea is that again, as horrifying as this sounds to most people in America, is that the kings were there to protect and they had a duty that was ingrained in them. And what's a lot of misconceptions about that time is one, the nobility and the kings, they fought their own battles. They didn't farm out poor people and send them over to Iraq while they were sitting pretty. They actually went and did the fighting themselves. And so, you know, whatever you might think about European Christianity, at least you got to give them some respect for going out and doing their own battling, right? And so this whole time is just bringing about this thousand years, however you want to take it. It's just, if it's an allegory, it's just a long time, right? But like I said, in the modern propaganda, there's the thousand years of darkness that we can never, ever return to that the modern world the Anglo-American Whig establishment will promote, the Masonic establishment, the Protestants, you know, unify with the Masons on this, generally speaking. And Protestantism, it evolves over time. And that's kind of the point that it keeps morphing and that rebellion sheds its new skin. And so Protestantism turns into the dissenters, turns into Freemasonry. And then that eventually turns into a lot of crazy stuff once the Jews are liberated in the Enlightenment. And then, you know, the, the Freudian kind of secular Jewish school comes about. And then there's sort of like the Zionist kind of like little dialectic where some Zionist Jews really hate the Marxist types or the, the liberal types. Uh, but sometimes they tend to work together and it's usually to attack the church and stuff like that. So my basic view on that time period is there was a lot of things being formulated and the socialism, this, this is kind of the, uh, I think the unifier, right? Where everyone's always complaining about, oh, Marxist socialism or capitalism. They're both wrong. They're both bad, right? That's kind of something that people in the alternative media. No, that's classic dialectic. Yeah. Right. And so 
that's kind of like the basis of the Holy Roman Empire is where there's a social duty to everyone around you, but there is an aristocracy. Yes. There is a chance for personal ambition, but it's not the expense of the people around you. You're not they actually to- had a term for this. It was called noblesse oblige, which was the obligation of the nobility towards the people. And that was pre-feudalism. Yeah. And so, you know, it, there's all these different struggles that go with that. And, um, but long story short, you know, I, I think that one thing that really woke me up to a lot of this was reading what some of the popes, and I would say the Jesuits before they were infiltrated in the 20th century, when you start reading what they were saying during the 19th century about, you know, I mean, they were condemning Marxism, capitalism, uh, Freemasonry, but like they, they, they like were outlying this is what's going to happen if this this and this is allowed to rule this is why we don't tolerate it and i gotta say all all the things that they warned about (laughs) came to fruition it's all the things we complain about today so whether you like the catholic church's method for putting that in chains they at least knew what they were talking about wow all right i just so that was really interesting for me to just sit back and listen to you guys talk because I, I don't have, I mean, Randy grew up with- No, no, kids. and I don't want you to do that. I, no, because... no, it was great for me to just sit back and listen to because I don't like, so, to be quite honest, and this is sort of my feeling as I've been going through Michael's series, is sometimes I agree with what he's saying, not that he had, not so much his opinions on things, but he can say something, oh yeah, I get that. And other times I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't know if I agree with that. And then other times, I just, to be honest, I just have no idea what he's talking about because when you come from- a background with no religion, which I was raised with. Mm-hmm. I mean, if there was a religion in my family, it was government because my, you know, my dad's, <laughs> political, my dad's a political science teacher and, you know, and he, that's sort of, um, their, you know, what wealthy sort of white or well-to-do white liberal, you know, progressivism, whatever the fuck you want to call it. That seemed to be the closest thing to any kind of doctrine or religion that I grew up with. But, you know, for me, mostly you're saying, yeah, whatever, I'm talking lots of fucking bullshit. And, you know, I, I bought into it on a certain level, but never at the level he did. So sometimes when you get into talking about these things for someone who wasn't raised with it, the na- the, just the, the, the language around it can be intimidating. Yeah, it can be. The stories sound different. I still, I mean, I struggle with that now, r- regardless of what kind of ancient text it is, whether it's like, you know, a Western one or a more Eastern one or whatever it is. I'm like, what the fuck are they even talking about? So. But that was actually pretty interesting to listen to. You know, and I'm, let me just say this, because <laughs> Michael and I do come from actually very divergent arts. Mm-hmm. I don't always agree or like even my own conclusions about things. I come to conclusions <laughs> about things that sh- shock me or piss me off. Mm-hmm. And I occasionally find myself agreeing with people I don't like. And, mm-hmm. and quite honestly, when we come into mysticism of whatever stripe mysticism is, it is inescapable that mysticism itself is going to overlap into the different arcs of mysticism that emanate out of different institutions, whether it's Catholic, Protestant, Freemasonry, um, the, um, the Golden Dawn, because there is a stream that goes through all of this. And so it's very difficult sometimes to parse it out and that's why you'll hear phrases and thoughts that sound Masonic when you understand that Freemasonry in its present form isn't really Freemasonry as it was originally founded. And that it actually has synthesized and syncretized huge streams yeah. into itself, just like the Golden Dawn, just like all the other mystical schools we presently have. Yeah, and that's actually very relative to some of the stuff that I've gone through where there was a masonry that was essentially Catholic where it was about, yes, the stone working, but it was also building into the art and the architecture what people might call, you know, the, 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 the geometry of God. Mm-hmm. The sacred and, geometry. This, yeah, this, and, this and I the, understand. This I know about. That, <laughs> this is why. I, yes, exactly. Yeah, and so, but it was more based upon the 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 material world with the Catholic theology driving it. So this gives you all the the awesome Gothic cathedrals and that kind of them. stuff, right? Yeah. 
And so at some point along the way, that kind of started to change into what we would call the, the, the modern masonry that we'd, re- we'd read in like Albert Pike in terms of like the more esoteric ones and the, 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 the theosophy of Levatsky and stuff like that. And I think that what happens is, oh, this is what really helped me understand a lot of this stuff. When I was reading through Isis Unveiled, um, you know, she's bashing a certain type of masonry and she calls it the uh, Jacobite masonry or the Stuart right. masonry. Now, this is right. tied to the Stuart monarchy, which had its yep. bouts with Protestantism, uh, Protestantism. And then some of the kings were like pseudo-Catholic, but not really. That's Charles I and II. And then finally, James II, he's like a true Catholic. He gets back on the throne. And of course, what overthrows him is the glorious revolution. And the Enlightenment gives us the leap out of these dark ages, right? And so... During this time, that that's the which mas- was Cromwell, right? Yeah, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's um basically a transition where this guy uh, he's a Protestant pastor who turns into a Freemason. I think it's James Anderson. He writes these M- Masonic constitutions. I think it's right. in 1723. And what they are is they're actually kind of Judaized, where he he. Uh, they're revealing the Noahides, the Noahide laws, the seven precepts, mm-hmm. precepts of Noah. That, that's kind of a Talmudic thing. And then, interestingly enough, there's some debate around his history. Even Masons will kind of get a little cranky about it. But his basic constitutions, from what I understand, became what modern Masonry is. And his constitutions were the first Masonic publication in the United States. And so you see this British Masonry that starts to be funneled into Europe and there is like a there's a proxy warrior version of it where it's the grand orient kind of crazy jacobins and then there's the more like refined one that's like oh we revere god and government and that happened in britain but the point is the reason they promote that in britain is so because they don't want the british government to go into this big chaos because they're the ones running the show right so they're going to promote the more exoteric masonry to keep their population in line and, and their constitutional monarchy. And then they're trying to promote the radical masonry into Catholic bourbon France to destroy it. And then the thing that really got me hooked is when I read the Memoirs of Jacobinism by Augustin Barrowell. He was a French Jesuit. Now, this is the book that exposes the Bavarian Illuminati. A lot of people say a lot of things about the Bavarian Illuminati, but if you actually want to know what they're really about, you would read this book. And this will shred any conceptions that the Jesuits have anything to do with the Illuminati. That is like one of the biggest things that frustrates me now after reading through this. And what happened was there was actually the Protestants were used as proxy warriors by the enlightenment philosophers like Voltaire and all these guys to try to attack Catholic France because they knew that they were a little fanatical and the Bavarian Illuminati scared the people out of the more older masonry that was at least more revering, you know, Christian theology and government. It, 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 it wrote these pretend degrees. It said, Oh, the Jesuits wrote these degrees. So you should get out of these. And of course that brings them into all the occult illuminist degrees. So the Jesuit fear porn that the Protestants have grown up with, I relate it to like the Jewish fear porn where they're afraid of the goy. The Protestants are afraid of the Jesuits. There's a, there's a parallel there. And so they use that, to scare all the Protestants into the occult masonry. And then the, you get all the, the German Illuminati stuff. It gets into like Swedenborg and all this Illuminism, kind of the stuff that you were talking about, this weird Protestant mysticism, Jakob Boomer or whatever, how you pronounce it. Um, so this book really sorts a lot of it out. It's, it's difficult reading, but this is one of the things I'm going over in the member section of the series. And I just did a podcast going through, and I'll, I'll just give you a couple quick examples. You guys will probably... Uh, know that there's something not quite right about this. So it's uh, Voltaire and all these people that are heroes of modern liberalism um, and the French Revolution. What this book does is it gives you their letters. And Voltaire has got like hundreds of, or hundreds of pages of letters and stuff. So this guy went through them all and started showing you the conspiracy where they're claiming that they're following the mysteries of Mithras and the tradition of Julian the Apostate and they're going to illuminate the masses by degrees. 
and they're going to use propaganda and slowly change definitions through their encyclopedia to usurp the bourbon aristocracy and that they don't care about the masses. They, they say, we don't care what the masses think. We're trying to promote our stuff for the aristocracy, but yet they always appeal to freedom and equality for the masses. So they're the biggest hypocrites and it's really very sordid what was happening. So even if you don't like Catholic bourbon France, what well, these guys did like to now. destroy it are much worse. It sounds just like now. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's my point. Everything we believe today right. came from this conspiracy. And it's just like kind of amazing to me when I was reading through that. I was like, wow, this French Jesuit is exposing this. And guess what the Protestants do? They blame the Jesuits for Freemasonry. It's like unbelievable. Like once it, it's just... Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> well, it's so much like now that, as I, I mentioned it to you, you weren't aware of it, there's actually a left-leaning socialist magazine called The Jacobin, right? So it's right. exactly like now, right? It it's is like the Young Turks, like now. right? Right, it's all exactly like now. So we're just kind of re- um, this is the further extended version, how many hundreds of thousands? Well, no, and it's really interesting because you mentioned Voltaire, and it was Voltaire who provided basically the fuel for the French Revolution. He was the intellectual prop behind what was supposedly the peasant uprising, but was actually orchestrated by the elites to transition Europe out of monarchies into, uh, I guess, basically the, the, the hybrid format that they evolved into. I mean, France has been a cesspool since the 1800s of intellectual corruption. I mean, that's where... That's the incubator for Marxism. It was the incubator for Judaism, the, the, the radical Judaism that gave us the state of Israel. That's where they incubated der Judenstadt. Um, so basically, behind the scenes, what you just talked about there is how they orchestrate, and it's not lost on me, that even in the populist movements here in the United States, whether it's the alt-right whether it's this QAnon thing that's, that's been driven into our consciousness, that what they do is they use a populist appeal, which behind the scenes is operating as a mask for the framework of the intellectual who is driving one narrative while creating the schisms that then divide and ultimately blow up the entire structure. Exactly. And they also goalpost shift where they use one criteria to attack yep. an enemy. And then when something switches, they'll use a completely different criteria, but they appeal to people exactly. who are a little bit more predisposed towards being a little more conservative and some people are a little bit more liberal minded. Mm -hmm. And the point of Catholicism, the way I understand it is, okay, everyone's life is a shit show, but the system of it is supposed to contain that shit show so you can be at peace with it. Versus the enlightenment is like liberate the shit show and make it even more of a shit show and then normalize the shit show so that everybody's passions and, and you know, whatever is out of control. And then they're even easier to manipulate. And now you look at America at the drop of the hat, everyone's triggered by anything. And they're triggered by something that all of a sudden the next day, they completely contradict that. And it's just, I mean, it's, it's sad. Intemperance. It's, it's, it's basically intemperance. Yeah. It's, and, it's, um, um, we must be really enlightened now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, the funny thing is, uh, going back to the Illuminati, when you're talking about Marxism, when you read through those doctrines, I mean, it is a primitive Marxism. It's basically, I mean, honestly, it's kind of like what the, the Jesuits became with like the Francis regime and the current Catholic Church, which is basically the Democratic Church of America. And that gets into a lot of weird things where, you know, the, the criticism of JFK from the Catholic viewpoint is that he deferred to the Masonic principles. And then when he started to have a conscience, they killed them. And so that's the idea that happens to a lot of these Christian monarchs. It's that they give the, these liberal revolutionaries an inch and they take a mile. And as soon as they want to put some brakes on, they turn around to devour them. And so that's happened with the, the you, Zars you know, in Russia. And you're too young. Both of you are too young to remember this, but I do. I was a kid when JFK was president. I distinctly remember the paranoia around it. The, the, you know, the papacy was coming to America as a result of electing Kennedy. 
Well, the real danger with Kennedy wasn't the papacy. It was the fact that they were also a bloodline family, deeply ensconced in, in, in all of the things that you had from the other competing bloodline families. I mean, this is a family that owns, literally owns the rights to import Scotch whiskey into the United States during the prohibition. I mean, you talk about a family that enjoyed enormous privilege. They were as much bloodline as the Rockefellers. But you watch decision points and you look at, at history and you realize that we're products of a number of things and one of them is our own conscience. And when you study JFK long enough, it is inescapable whatever conspiracy theories you subscribe to, I've subscribed to them all. I've studied JFK since I was a teenager. That at some point, he made critical decisions that were moral decisions, however moral or immoral he was. There was a, a temperance there in him that triggered a certain moral response. Yeah, and I think that that whole thing is like this weird like if you want to take it to a metaphysical perspective, there's like, to me, something cosmic going on in the 60s because right when JFK was assassination is when Vatican II happened. And I'm not one that would overly bash Vatican II. It's just that the liberals, in my opinion, yeah. that wanted to progress the church really won out. And there's a lot of propaganda around Vatican I that, that when I looked into it, a lot of people don't understand that, that the liberals were freaking out because they thought that Pope Pius the ninth syllabus of errors, which basically condemns modern liberalism, would become a dogma through papal infallibility. But a Masonic war broke out and Vatican II kind of, or excuse me, one kind of got, got cut short. And so papal infallibility, like it doesn't, it almost doesn't even mean anything when I listen to theologians. It's like for the Pope to make an infallible statement, you have to have like a full moon in France with cicada well, bugs this is like or something. To, this, is, <laughs> this is like you put the whiteboard up and you draw out arcane glyphs. And that is the thought process that you then go through, which nobody understands. Nobody understands it because they're using philosophical language. They're, they're, they're using construction of thought based on a very elaborate type of reasoning that you go to university and spend eight years studying philosophy to understand exactly how they're, how they're working through this. So it's too dense for the average person. You know, I yeah, think- what, I th Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, and I'm curious to know what you think about Vatican II, even in terms of the Latin mass and what, because I know personally Catholic people in this area, I talk to them and some of them, are very much in favor and are trying to move back into the Tridentine Mass again. Yeah, um, that's that's something that's affected me recently, actually, um, because I, I uh, for anyone who's Catholic who understands these things, I don't have a problem with the Novus Ordo in terms of it not, like some people say it's not valid. I wouldn't say that, but I've also, I'm still absorbing a lot of this. That's just where I'm at at the time. But I've had a lot of problems recently in it and a lot of the things in the Novus Ordo Mass, I'm just like, it's just cringe. Like you're watching it. You know, I'm like, it's like I'm in the theater watching Spice World. I'm just cringing. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm embarrassed to be here. You know what I mean? And I, I'll, I'll admit that I went to Spice World when I was in like seventh or eighth grade. It was just so embarrassing for myself. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Well, you just did it yourself too. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyways, it's it's like that where it's like I don't even want to be here, and so now um, I went to the one Latin mass left in my state, and oh man, it just solved all those problems. But I think there's <laughs> certainly something to be said about that. Um, and uh, back to like the Vatican one thing, it's almost like people think the papal infallibility rather than what it is, which is kind of not really that significant. It's significant for everyone else in their mind. And so when it was going on at the time and the, the papacy was more strongly tied to its old tradition roots, everyone hated that idea. But now that Francis is Pope, everyone's like, oh, yeah, it's like almost like the liberal Catholics will invoke papal infallibility. You got to listen to Pope Francis. You got to listen to everything he says. Otherwise, you're not a real Catholic. And that's that's the goalpost shifting. Right. And so there's a lot of that media manipulation going around and they changed a lot of narratives on things. And in my opinion, made the, the church a lot more Masonic 
uh, in, in terms of the, the ambiguity of things. And so I'd say there's, uh, if anyone was ever interested in Catholicism and you just wanted to check out a mass, I would, I would recommend you go to the Latin mass if you can. I absolutely recommend it. I, I, it's funny. I was thinking about this. I was listening to your video series on YouTube and I flashed back to about, maybe about 12 years ago, I was actually in conversations with a lot of Catholic people. Um, there's a very prominent Catholic university south of here, um, a Benedictine college that I went to, and there's also Mount St. Mary's, which is close to the Maryland line from here, meeting with men who either were converted Protestants to Catholicism. I was sort of a recruiting into all this, because at that time I was heavily into evangelical Christianity. I attended a mass. We have a cathedral here in the state capital that's also called St. Patrick's Cathedral. It's not as large as the one in New York, but it's quite grand. It is actually a literal cathedral. And I went there on the night of Black Friday to attend what's called a Tenebrae service, if you know what that is. It's really the Stations of the Cross, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was done in Latin, high mass, with this Gothic organ that was used to play the Tenebrae music. And I have to tell you something. I know a little bit of Latin because I had two years of Latin in school, but the language barrier was actually not an issue. The whole thing was so profound. I'm going to tell you something. I got up from that service. I was weeping. I literally walked out of there emotionally shaken by that experience. And so, you know, you talk about mysticism, how they can instill in you the somber reverence. I mean, literally, you feel like you just witnessed something profound. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think everybody should attend the Latin Mass. Yeah, and I think that that gets into the idea of I mean, this is what I, I guess I appreciate about Catholicism after understanding it better. Uh, if people can deal with the morality and all the things that are the tough stuff, if you get past that, there is something kind of for everybody where there's the high philosophy and theology for the people who want to debate about those things. I'm not really one of them. I'm just kind of like one of those transitional period where I can kind of grab a couple things from those debates and maybe translate them to some people who don't know anything about them. But in terms of the mystical aspect. I mean, this is actually one of the things that kind of blew my mind. I was reading a Catholic website. It's like a resource site. It's called fisheaters.com. And it's just this huge website with all these things. And I, I started to realize that astrology is actually kosher in Catholicism under certain restrictions. And it's based on Thomas Aquinas's views and mm -hmm. uh, St. Albert. And once I started reading their views on astrology, I was like, oh man, that's actually the astrology that I've already been doing in some way. It's just a lot more clear and more defined. And that's actually something I do now is the Catholic version of astrology where I, there's a lot of common themes and broad things that are part of the astrological tradition as people might know it today. Well, at one time, astrology and astronomy were one discipline. Exactly. And the Enlightenment destroyed that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Isn't that funny? I even knew that. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what I was, uh, and, you know, a, there are certain Catholic traditions that kind of went a little bit more in that rationalist viewpoint. I mean, some people will complain about Thomism leading to atheism. That's kind of a popular polemic. I don't agree with that, but I think it can when it's like taught in a certain paradigm and it's too rigid. Um, and like I said, I'm not an expert on these things, but these are things I just kind of glean from it. But back to like the mystical aspect of it, I mean, the whole viewpoint is that from Thomas Aquinas is that there is a, uh, an influence on us in the temporal realm from the planets that gives us inclinations. And the idea that the old pagan astrology was tied to fate, it was that, well, you're bound, you got a Jupiter squared Venus and your relationships are going to be traumatic and awful and you know you're going to meet a bunch of manipulative women or something like that that would be like the faded version of that whereas the point in Catholicism is that everyone has free will and you can rise above those things but it's also through the company of uh, you know God's grace and the sacraments in conjunction 
with what the birth chart can illuminate about parts of your psyche and that kind of self analysis, psychological uh, function. And I would even go so far as to say, you don't even need that viewpoint of Aquinas to be true. You can still treat it like a Rorschach test and come to the same result. As long as you have a particular philosophy driving it, like I was talking about the gas driving it versus the, the chart is like the car, the created thing, the, the spiritual gas, I guess it's to, I think, you know, in all fairness, too, I think we have to go back and understand that the early church fathers, like Origen and Tertullian, were actually using Neoplatonism as the platform by which they were filtering this mystical work. I mean, there is a logic to all of this that comes from that, that Hellenistic world that was kind of merged into Roman culture as well. Absolutely. And I, I think the, the way to describe the Catholic Church, as far as I understand, it's kind of like the unity of the best parts of Plato with the unity of the best parts of Aristotle and then purging the things that don't work within the theology. And that's why, like Plato, if you read his Republic and stuff like that, it sounds a lot like today and it's kind of screwed up where like <laughs> there, there's it, like literally like I was reading some of his viewpoints on the state and it's like the state is God and they would they would arrange marriages in secret where people think that they were just like getting some woman and drawing lots to go reproduce, but they were like arranged by the rulers. And then once they had their kids, the kids would be handed over to the state. And that's kind of like a lot of things going on today where the state rules your children, not the parents. Whereas Aristotle was about the family unit. And it's interesting because you'll have people like Carl Sagan and Cosmos in DeGrasse Tyson, they bash Aristotle. So there's something about the Aristotelian mindset that the liberal establishment likes to bash from that yeah, kind of always do, left yeah. side, you know? Well, that's the portrayal to a Plato as, as, a, as, a, as a liberal, which was semi-true, but not really. Uh, it's difficult to read, I think, those old Greek philosophers in a modern context because the mindset's so very different. And that's oh, even yeah, true, sure. you know, if you go back and you read, I mean, Tertullian or Origen especially, is the, it's difficult to parse the mindset because you're basically still in that, in, in a different mind that we no longer have in the 21st century. Exactly. And there's a, it's a metaphysical mind. And that's why a lot of the Neoplatonism, there's like a battle between the Neoplatonists and the Catholic Church on some level and th- the thing is, there is like overlap in their idea and understanding of the, the order and the logos. It's a passion play. Earth. I mean, effectively, you know, you had the pantheon of the gods, which was really the staging and polytheism that merged over into monotheism. And you go back and read the Old Testament and tell me that this is not a polytheistic system there. Because it very much is, in terms of the gods that are present in that creation, even, if you take it literally. But if we come forward and we merge into monotheism, you still have the same passion play going on of the upper and the lower and how humanity is driven by being in this physical body and all the forces that come to play and how... I keep using this word. I don't know why temperance is important. That seems to be a constancy as you go into monotheism. It's extreme in some cases, like the God of judgment, the God of love. Yeah, and I think that one of those things is that there's a there's a big element to how you actually read any of these texts. And that that that's kind of obvious that you know, anybody can kind of make something to be out something that it's not, or they can co-op something that is what it is and add something else that's what it's not. And I think that from what I understand, the biblical, the Catholic viewpoint on the Old Testament is that sometimes the literal interpretation is the literal context of the people at that time and how they view Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And that's also is, Protestant does Protestantism does that too. There is a discomfort level to all of this. And especially when you go back and you look at root languages, 
you know, and you and I might not agree on this. Um, I have a very radical view of certain things in the Old Testament, largely because I read it more mystically, and because of the fact that I also interpret what went on there in terms of how man was interfered with by outside forces when you begin to look at the Nephilim and the giants and the interplay of what we would call uh, Satan, Lucifer, and, and the demons. Um, that humanity, again, whether you consider them gods or demiurge or whatever, there were forces there at play that were basically warring against man himself in the spiritual realms. And I think the New Testament, especially when you um, begin to look at some of the writings of Paul, indicate that very much, the whole spiritual warfare concept. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, for me, the way I look at it is I think that my personal opinion and the reason why I'm, you know, now back at the Catholic Church is I think that they do the best job of unifying the supernatural parts of the Bible that are taught. Some of them people will have a hard time believing them, but with the allegorical parts as well. And I think that sometimes Protestantism either makes it all too literal or they reverse <laughs> and, and make literal what the Catholic was making allegorical. And sometimes this gets into like more crazy end time stuff where Protestants will think. Oh, no, that, I don't disagree with you there. I mean, you know, unlike you, I'm not going back to Protestantism either. So. <laughs> well, yeah, I've just kind of given an example of what people are accustomed to. You know, like I think the, the everything is literal in here. It's almost like the Pharisees where they're worshiping the law or the, the, the letter itself. And that's the point of the cath uh, Catholicism is there's tradition mixed with the scriptures. And that is exactly the point. You're right. I mean, the, and this is an important distinction as well of one of the things that I was told by Catholic theologians that argued against literal biblical Christianity, which was the evangelical wing, is that we honor tradition, meaning they look back to the church's early founders and what was written there. Mm -hmm. And they're very careful to parse allegory from literalism and symbolism and all of that's all of that's really important, and, and that's that's where Protestantism lost it. Uh, I lost it over biblical literalism. I finally, I was finally at the place where I said, "You have too many problems with this. You can't make this work." If you begin to apply that Platonic Aristotelian logic system, it doesn't it doesn't make sense. So yeah, you know. and then when you can interpret it, like this was always my problem with Protestantism, where it's like, okay. You have this paradigm, generally speaking, that, oh, all I need is my Bible, my Jesus, and my Holy Spirit, right? And I always do a Southern accent, don't mean to bash people from the South, but that's kind of like the, the, the caricature, right? And, and so it's like, okay, well, how come this person's Holy Spirit is conflicting with this person's mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, conflicting with this person, da, 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 and it just goes on and on. And I'm, I'm, my point is that that's what the Catholics said about the Reformation. It's going to create the Ouroboros serpent of revolution that devours itself because they all argue with each other about whose Holy Spirit is correct. And at the same time, that allows the New World Order to be leashed or un unleashed, Satan unbound into oh, the crap. world. You brought up the New World Order. And here we are. We're like, we got 10, 15 minutes left in this segment. But you want to, I don't know. Emily, feel Hi. free to jump, jump in. <laughs> For somebody who did, wasn't going to say much tonight because their throat was hurting, somebody sure found his voice. <laughs> Welcome back, Randy. It's um, a miracle. <laughs> Randy Praise hasn't Jesus. had that much to say in two years. <laughs> anyway, well, okay. So as I listen to you guys talk talk through all of this, I can, I can follow on most of this in the segment of the conversation. But one of the things that I would be sort of uh, remiss if I didn't ask you about is I think that we can all acknowledge that, like, and certainly what, I, what I've gleaned a lot from listening to some of your series is that you can sort of understand some of the issues that people may have, whether they like it or not, with the old world religions or with, with old world. The old world order. Old world order, right? But this new thing, Protestantism, and certainly it is is worse right like i can get kind of what you're saying with that and that a lot of these people who are saying that not only like they're they're complaining about the new world order and then 
they're doing the thing that is worse. And so it doesn't make a lot of sense. Like their criticisms are, it's like, you know, it's like when a fat person calls another fat person fat, <laughs> you know, as someone who's not as fat as them. Like, like I, I, you see this all the time. Like I had this chick that I was friends with back when I used to work at the Cheesecake Factory. We used to make fun of fat people and she was way bigger than they were. I couldn't quite understand like where this was coming from. That's kind of what it is in my mind. It reminds me of, but one of the things that, uh, for all the beauty and mysticism, and I agree, there is some, there is something very um, interesting about the Catholic Church. I think they're beautiful. I'm not a religious person, but I can admire some of the beauty of the old kind, the the the, the services and whatnot. Like you know, it's a lot more. Um, there's a lot more ambiance to that than there is if you go to like the it's high church. If you go to the church that looks like the Costco that's up on the hill above where I live, <laughs> right? There's like a mall parking lot and it looks the like Costco, mega Costco, church, right? It looks so like I could, that, all that stuff is beautiful, um, and the some of the newer forms of the of religion, the Protestantism and whatever, seem to lack some of that. But one of the things that for someone who doesn't know a lot about religion that I have noticed is. While it exists in all religions, there seems to be a serious problem with pedophilia in the Catholic Church. You and I had a little bit of a conversation about that and, and what it really is and maybe where some of that comes from. But I, if I didn't ask about that, I feel like I'd be remiss. Like, oh, yeah. Okay, so there are some good things that people have trashed and that they replace what was, you know, a somewhat functional and, and in ways beautiful kind of system with something that was total trash and not beautiful. But this is a part that we can't overlook. What kind of say you about this and, and how do we sort of square that away? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, and that's obviously one of the things it, it's weird because like on the liberal side of it, they'll condemn it. But what's never really understood is that most of the priests that are involved in these scandals are the liberal Catholics <laughs> promoting sexual liberation and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's one aspect of it there. And then the other aspect is that this is the more conspiratorial aspect is that there was a lot of infiltration that was planned to go into the Catholic church during the earlier part of the 20th century. And a lot of these happened from like the more communist groups that tried to infiltrate and they became priests and then they appointed all of their buddies. And there's a guy named Dr. Taylor Marshall. He's more of a Thomas traditional guy, but he, does this uh he had this book called infiltration he ties some of these certain bishops i think or certain players in this to some it, it's not like a direct tie but the the overlap is enough to make you suspicious there's like some weird like i think like oto crowley group that that one of these guys the main players is tied to you'd have to go watch his thing on it but there's that one aspect and then there's uh things if you believe like the bella dodd narrative where they're these communists are told to infiltrate on purpose and basically destroy the church from within. And then you have also the Catholics are really like kind of original conspiracy theorists because there's always been infiltration from the start. And that gets back into Paul in the new Testament. There's a lot of Gnosticism infiltrating and a lot of Gnosticism. I think what people actually understand what it is with some of these groups, Gnosticism is like Protestantism. There's a big umbrella of what can fall under that category. But some of the things in it are very anti-women. Um, they're anti-creator and hostile, and their cosmology is that the creator is an abortion. And I've, I tied that to the, the modern feminist movement where women having an abortion is a, a, a magic ritual of the Gnostic Sophia aborting Yaldabaoth. You see this in Prometheus with Ridley Scott. You see this in Rosemary's Baby. And all this kind of stuff, right? These are all like Gnostic movies. Um, and so these things tie into some of the infiltration. And then in a lot of Gnosticism, sometimes there's like a more extreme kind of Sabbatean Frankist thing. That's a whole different rabbit hole. But there was a lot of Frankists trying to convert to Catholicism in like the Ottoman Empire area in Germany and kind of Eastern Europe. And then there's they were also rebelling against like the rabbinical elite, but it sounds like some of the rabbinical elite were encouraging them to convert to Catholicism because then they'd be proxy warriors destroying the Catholic church with their crazy sex rituals and all that, that kind of nutty stuff. So 
my point is there's a lot of infiltration aspects that are involved. And at the same time, there's a lot of things that are terrible behavior in the church that is absolutely real. And here's the, the thing about it. One, there's a reaction to that that's understandable, like Protestant Reformation. But at the same time, here's the key. When those people react, what do they do in that reaction? How do they behave? And they actually become much, much worse. And this is the idea of the Protestants. If you actually, if you use their same criteria for how they were judging the church during this time and you applied it to them, it's just like unbelievable how, yeah. how terrible those empires went. And some people will call that a dialectic, but the way I would look at it is, this is the interesting thing. During the Renaissance, there was some Neoplatonism that came in from Byzantium when the Ottoman Empire took over and the fall of Constantinople. Basically, Christian, the Eastern Church fell, and there's some gripes about that from Eastern Orthodox. We won't get into it, but there's a lot of Neoplatonism that was in Constantinople. So that came into Rome, and that sparked a lot of the Renaissance. Now, the Renaissance, there's a couple of different ways that can go. One, I think that there's some really beautiful benefits of it, and then there was also some extreme degeneracy. And from that came the Medici banking, usury, the heliocentrism based upon the pagan cosmology, the Talmud started to allow being printed. And this is the idea that a lot of Jews were capitalizing this. And there's a lot of Kabbalah overlap during this time. And so my point would be there's a lot of infiltration. And sometimes the infiltrators are tied to these groups. Sometimes it's people just succumbing to the infiltration and all of a sudden, yeah. You're, 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 you know, it's just like anybody. I mean, for me in my life, when I was at my probably not so proudest moments, part of me thought either I wasn't really doing anything wrong or part of me didn't like what I was doing. But since everyone else is doing worse than me, I felt, Hey, I'm, I'm actually a good person comparatively. So there's, there's a lot of psychological things in attached to a person's own situation. Yeah. And then unfortunately, when you kind of get addicted to something bad, two years later, you're like, how did I end up here? Yeah. And so you can probably see that as like a tragic case with a lot of the people in the church. So they're, they're in a way they're, they're no different than people, but they're human. They're human. yeah. But the idea is that there's a, that there's a tradition that's outside of humanity that is there for you to conform to. You have the free will choice to do that or not. And that's the key factor is free will. And so if you think about the old Testament, as much as people have a problem with it, generally speaking, the idea of Israel, when they behave, then they're given blessings and they're doing good things. When they're succumbing to the degeneracy, they're the ones who get punished more because they should know better. And that's the point of Europe in the Catholic Church, where when people should know better, you actually see them get hit a lot worse. And I'd say that that's why so many of the Catholic politicians today are the worst ones in America. Interesting. So one of the things that came up as I was listening to you, which also relates to something we didn't get to talk to today, but maybe we'll have another conversation sometime. I do notice in relation to what you just said, that the same leftist liberals that criticize the Catholic church for the pedophilia scandals also think that things like man, boy, love should be legalized. They also support NAMBLA. So it is kind of goes to what you were talking about. I think in either part of Point three or six point four, where you were talking about all these leftist vegans who are also like not only pro-choice but like pro-late like afterbirth abortion kind of shit, right? So like we're gonna save the animals but kill the babies. Like it's the same. So I do see that aspect as well. Yeah, and actually to to elaborate on that real quick, that will address the rest of your question. Um, if you actually look at I guess it's statistics, um, here, here's an interesting thing. Uh, there's, there's a couple, I, I, I did it, I, I can't remember which video it is, but I addressed all these things in the video. Um, and basically, Protestant churches have a lot more sex abuse than the Catholic Church, but the reason why you hear about in the Catholic Church, one is the media, and a lot of, there's a lot of Jewish power behind the media, and they obviously don't like the Catholic Church, so they're going to do it, they wilt with that. Um, and then, at the same I like time, slip that in there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have um, the Catholic Church has more money than the Protestant churches because it's centralized. Where the Protestant, like I could go create a Protestant church, and I'm not bound to any other authority, right? Which sounds nice in theory. I get it. That's yeah. like everybody in their 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 liberal mindset, which is 
my mindset for most of my life. There's no diocese like there. I, I don't need an authority to tell me what to do. I can interpret this and that how I want. But the idea <laughs> is that, well, why are things getting worse and people making dumber decisions the more they believe that? And so is there something to the idea of an original sin in the, in the context of a practical way that mankind kind of leads towards bad things on their own without correction? And you could probably see this with children who are, can be tyrants and this is why when parents don't discipline them, all of a sudden, their children turn out to be the leftist kids in universities freaking yeah. out about all this stuff. And so long story short, the, um, the, the, the reason that the Protestant churches aren't persecuted is because they don't have money. And so the lawyers go after the Catholic church because they have more money. So it's actually a, a travesty that there's more abuse in the Protestant churches, but people won't go after them because it's not, it's not lucrative enough. That's one of the aspects. The other aspect is, the public schooling system, which teaches us science, which debunks stupid religion, right? Science is God and it's the best thing ever and we should all conform to it. Well, you're, I think the highest rates of abuse are in public schools. So all the liberals complaining about the Catholic Church's abuse, well, why aren't you projecting that same criteria? If everything's equal, right? Everything's right. equal. Why aren't you projecting that onto the public school system, which is like, I don't know, I think it's 20% of the abuse cases come from public schools and it's like 2% are from Catholics. Yeah. And I think that most other churches are kind of like the Catholic church is on the lower tier of the abuse. You just hear about it more. And the other thing I mentioned is that people have no idea how much sexual abuse there are in yoga cults. Oh yeah. I was, yeah. I, I didn't even know this. I just kind oh, of like, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, and you find that so many, the, the founders, right? The yep. seed of which the tree grows into yeah. of a lot of these yoga movements were actually totally. either, um, some of them were pedophiles, but more of them were just like basically seducing their yoga students. Yep. You know, and absolutely. So no one well, seems to have a problem importing okay a bunch of that in here. It's an Eastern system. It's an Eastern system, which is always better than a Western system or a traditional system or whatever in these people's eyes. I'll, I'll kind of finish out what you said with, with, with two things. Um, as a person who origi originally came from the left and grew up in a left family, um, the hypocrisy, right? Like any small statement that could even resemble a whiff of like anything racist is blown up when it's someone on the right who says it. But the racism on the left, especially right now, is beyond. Like I've never seen such racist shit in my entire life. So I'll say that. And then to what you're going to we're talking about, about there being a moral authority that the left or people or pro has tried to escape and, and because they think it's tyrannical or whatnot, I don't have much love for what I call like, um, like governmental authority or like declared authority. But I think there is something really important about earned authority, right? When someone has proven that they really know what they're talking about through the way that they're passionate about something, the way that they live it, they express it through their own life. There is something really important about that. And, and, and boundaries can be important. Like all the problems that I got in, like there were no rules in my house and that led to all the problems that I had. I was able to do whatever I wanted when I was a kid and, and I didn't have boundaries. And all the things that I struggle with as an adult are because of that. And so I don't know that I, from a personal standpoint, believe in government or the church as the proper person to, uh, to sort of run that authority over people or whatever. But I do think that there are some ideas, there are ideas and morals that are superior to and more important than others. And that when we stray way too far from that, we end up in a situation like mine, which was, I was an intelligent person with lots of talent running around doing everything I could to destroy my life. You know what I mean? And nobody was stopping me. Yeah, and you're, yeah. you come from like a more Jewish liberal tradition, right? Yeah, yes. And so maybe you have some sort of psychic connection to rebelling against the rabbinical Talmudic authority, which is really strict about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And that is a dialectic in and of itself where, uh, I mean, this is what's interesting about Napoleon. Napoleon wanted to assimilate the Jews into the Enlightenment Masonic principles. Uh, I'm not saying he, was, he wasn't initiated into Freemasonry as far as I can tell, but all of his Paul, I mean, I don't care if someone's initiated into Freemasonry or not. During that time, if you're promoting enlightenment, you're basically promoting Masonic ideology. I mean, Masonic ideology is what everyone believes today anyways. And so the point is that the, the Jews were liberated from the rabbinical authorities for the enlightenment 
But the point is a lot of them kept a certain amount of rebellion and that turned into a lot of the Bolshevism mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And that's what the, the Catholic church teaches as, as much as this sounds crazy or like this is the anti-Semitism of the church. They're saying that there is sort of like this ingrained rebellion in the Jewish spirit, mm-hmm. but when it's under these certain ideologies that are destructive, it becomes even more destructive. And so it's actually a charity to try to bring them back home to where they're supposed to be in the church. Now people can disagree with that or not, but that's kind of the teaching. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting that, okay, that sounds like a crazy teaching, but if you actually analyze history and look at the developments of things and the trajectories of groups on the whole, I'm saying everybody's individual situation is differently, but you, let's say seven out of 10, I like to use a seven out of 10 rule. If there's a particular ideology that seven out of 10 times, if somebody adopts a vegan diet, it usually doesn't go good for them. You can probably right. understand that, right? <laughs> There's going to be the three out of 10 so that are just fine. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so yeah. that's kind of the point is like, there's a tendency and an inclination. Like if somebody considers himself a liberal or they vote democratic in, in America, I can probably predict a lot of the things that they believe in, right? It might not be everything for every single situation, but I bet you seven out of 10 times, I'm going to probably get that, you know, they believe in vaccines and, you know, Darwin and stuff like that, right? Well, I'm, yeah, totally, I'm starting to look, I'm trying to figure out if there are any alt-right vegans and if there are any far-left carnivores. That's kind of what I'm interested <laughs> in looking into right now because of exactly what you're saying. Because it would be interesting if our diet also was that closely connected to our political ideology. But yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And I would argue that the alt-right is the dialectic to kind of like the liberalism because they're still fueled on the enlightenment principles, but they took on the more German version versus like the, the French or British. The alt-right is the alt-right is basically neoliberalism. If you look at it ideologically, you're going to find out that it's not conservatism as we understood conservatism traditionally. It is neoliberalism. Exactly. And that's why when I was reading these books on Germany, the pan Germans, which developed into the Nazis, a lot of them are considered liberals, and that was confusing to me. So liberal is a term, you kind of got to define it, right? It's mm-hmm. easy to toss it around because no, we have a No, it also is very right elastic. Now. All of these terms yeah. are very elastic. <laughs> yeah, conservative, yeah. liberal. You know. none, of these, none of these are useful benchmarks anymore. Yeah, um, and I think one thing that's interesting about the alt-right and the, the kind of stemming out of the, the Nazi tradition you know, I'm willing to concede that there's a lot of propaganda around Germany during that time. But what's really interesting is if you read some of these pre-Nazi writers and people like Adolf Hitler, they hated the Jesuits, they hated the Habsburgs, and that represented the old world church. And what I don't understand about Protestant conspiracies is they blame the Nazis on the Catholic church and the Jesuits. But if you actually read the propaganda from coming from the Nazis, they have no love for the church unless they want to adopt the racialism, but that would be that would be heresy, basically. And they promoted Luther as an Aryan hero of which they could rally against. And so it's like, I'm sorry, but like it's the complete opposite, you know? And I just hear all these Jesuit like conspiracy else. theories. You like know? everything else. It pretty much is the opposite of what it says it is. Exactly. And so, we are bumping up against time here. We want to flip over to our patrons. And uh, to that end, Michael Joseph, let people know where you can be found, how you can be found, and what your current activities are. I know that you, uh, well, you tell them. (laughs) Sure. Well, I have a new website. It's called rockstaresoterica.com. I'll give you guys the link so you can post them. And I basically have a member's site, a paid site, try to make it affordable. It's got a ton of content, and it's designed to appeal to different people where I have one series where I go through what I call the Catholic alchemy, where I, I take a lot of Catholic principles, but I use all the occult stuff. I use the astrology. I use the cult hermetic ideas and we sort of transmute them and we kind of fuse them together. So that's for the people who might be more on the, you know, Hellenized pagan side of things. And then for the people on the more, you know, Judaized side of things, I have the, the Catholic day of rest series, which just basically teaches the Catholic teaching from the Catholic study Bible, if people are interested in that. So it's kind of like the two sides of the coin. I try to be able to fuse them together in harmony, but still separate them out. And then I have the hardcore research, which is a lot of the stuff that I'm drawing from today. And then I do the podcast and people can sign up for the podcast only, which is a lot cheaper. And I just condense all things that I research into a few hours. 
So there's kind of a lot of things for other people, depending on your situation, in terms of affordability and amount of time you can invest listening and the different type of topics you're interested in. Also, guys, Michael does really great uh, astrological readings that are completely different than any other astrologer that I've ever, ever experienced, but equally as valuable. It's really, I, I had a reading from you that was really like more of a confirmation of life path than like a prediction or a director as to what I should do in the future. It was more like, okay, you see, when this was like this, that's why this happened. So when those things come up in the future, now I'm aware of like what that, what, what is going on, what is happening. And so, you know, I was able to really easily see that like, oh, I see that, that thing that he talked about. That was the time I didn't follow my intuition. My intuition was right, but I didn't listen to it. When that comes up again or something similar, I know what to do now. So it was a little bit, it was very, very different, but really cool also. So I suggest people check that out as well. Yeah. And I have a description of the astrology in depth on the site that people can read through. And if, you know, they're interested, whether they're interested in Catholicism or not, and they just like to hear the perspective, whether they choose to agree with it, it's, it's there. <laughs> cool. cool. Awesome. Uh, all the links down below in the little box, check it out. Show notes there as well. And, uh, and, and anything else we want to be heard saying going out on this segment, Emily? No, we'll just see you guys over on the other side, patreon.com yeah. forward slash off planet media. See you there yeah. in a minute. Yep. This is Off Planet Radio.